pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Payam Sadai, who is one of our still relatively new uh, faculty in pediatric surgery, uh, who also had special training in pediatric colorectal surgery, which is becoming a subspecialty within the field of, of uh, pediatric surgery itself, and recently held uh, le this weekend, in fact, um, an international symposium on pediatric colorectal surgery with the families of the REACH organization, which is the family of, of uh, patients with Hirschsprung's disease, and was able to sort of highlight some of the expertise that we now have in the region and really the only center like this in California. So Dr. Sadai is going to speak to us. Um, I think being sensitive that this is mostly an adult crowd uh, talking about when children with some of these uh, particular anomalies become adults and what the issues are there. So Dr. Sadai, thank you. Thank you very much. Can you, can, I, can everyone hear me? Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Farmer. Thank you to the department for allowing me to present. As Dr. Farmer stated, the topic today is going to be when children become adults and how do we transition the care of these pediatric colorectal patients to the adult side. And I hope you also take away from that that it's not just pediatric colorectal patients that need transitioning. It's really all pediatric patients with um, lifelong issues. <laughs> So disclosures, I was once a child. I am now an adult. Um, so I have, rel I have um, expertise on both sides. I have no other relevant disclosures. So I thought we could start with some case scenarios. And we'll, we'll let you guys think about how you would answer and how would you respond in these scenarios. And then we'll come back to the scenarios at the end of the presentation and kind of see if we can come to any sort of conclusions or potential answers. The first case is a 45-year-old male with Hirschsprung's disease who's had a pull-through. Not quite sure what that is. Maybe I know, maybe I don't know. Um, he presents your office asking about chances for colorectal cancer. He wants to know if he needs a colonoscopy. He's 45. I'll let you just think for a couple seconds as to how you might answer that scenario or how you would refer him. The next patient is a 29-year-old female with something called a cloaca. It's repaired, but she does have fecal incontinence. She has an appendicostomy in her right lower quadrant. She has a metrophenoff, which is part of the appendix being connected to the bladder that's coming out her umbilitis. She comes to you as a level one trauma. She's transiently stable, but after multiple transfusions, you decide that she probably needs a laparotomy and you think that she's gonna need her spleen out. So as you're going to the OR, your bright chief resident asks you what kind of incision she should make. The third case is a 35-year-old male who's had a rep repaired imperfect anus. He has chronic constipation despite bowel management lifelong. His GI sends him to you because he thinks that there may be a stricture at his anoplasty. You're barely able to pass your pinky on digital rectal exam. So determine, to determine his ability for fecal continence and whether a strictoplasty might be helpful for him, you ask the patient what, kind of, what kinds of questions. Our fourth case is a 25-year-old female with cerebral palsy and developmental delay. She has a G-tube. She has a tachostomy tube. And she comes with a large bowel obstruction. On X-LAP, you find a massively dilated colon, mostly on the proximal side, with volvulus. As you com contemplate what operation to perform, your resident, who just happened to reemerge from Dr. Farmer's lab, asks if this could be Hirschsprung's disease. As you're debating and thinking and having a discussion about that, what operation are you going to perform? The fifth case, and the last case, is a 47-year-old female who has severe colonic distension for a few years. She's very frustrated. For the last year, she's had seven ER visits. Her gastroenterologist performs an anorectal manometry and reports to you that there's an absent rare. He wants to know whether or not she would benefit from an ostomy or whether or not she might need part of her colon or all of her colon out. So you perform a rectal biopsy, and the pathologist reports that there is hypogangliosis. 
What's your next step? So these are all scenarios that we've encountered, that I've encountered, via which here at UC Davis. I think we've all been here. One side or the other side, I'm not sure. So for today's talk, I'm going to talk about the transitioning of care for the pediatric colorectal patient. We're going to talk about why we need to transition, and then what's the actual experience of a current adult colorectal patient. These patients are out there, um, and there's more and more of them. What are the goals of transitioning? Are there any models that we could look at to help us figure out how to transition? What do we, as pediatric surgeons and my colleagues in the room, what do we need to do? What's our responsibility? And then what, how do we need to collaborate with all the adult providers in the room, which is the majority of the audience? The three ages of man. <laughs> so how do we define transition of care? Well, very simply, the transition of care is the move from a pediatric to adult caregiver but importantly, in an adult medical setting. And I think that's, what, that's one piece of it that we don't always think about. It's not just going from the pediatric surgeon to the adult surgeon. It's actually that pediatric patient moving from a completely different medical setting to an adult medical setting. And what does that mean, and how do we manage that? This is not just true for colorectal surgery, even though that's what I'm going to focus on today. This is true for a host of other specialties. Congenital heart disease is a major issue. Dr. Rahm and Dr. Rath deal with this. There are adult survivors of congenital heart disease that are living longer and longer. In one study, about 63% of adult survivors of congenital heart disease had a lapse in their care in that transitioning, which led to a 3.1-fold increase in acute cardiac interventions. That's preventable. Endocrinology is an issue. Patients that have had, for example, pheochromocytoma and need surveillance or have had resections and need surveillance may come to Dr. Campbell as an adult and need to figure out how do we manage them, how do we screen them. Patients with von Hippel Lindau, patients with MEN syndromes. Vascular surgery. Dr. Pera and Dr. Irwin recently did a resection of a brachial artery aneurysm here at UC Davis in a young child. That child has a congenital aneurysm and thus is at risk for other aneurysms throughout his body. How do we survey him? How do we screen him? What does he need? There are no guidelines. Do we do yearly MRIs? Do we do ultrasounds of each extremity? We're not sure, but we're going to not just figure out what to do for him, but we're going to set the path forward for all patients like this. Thoracic surgery. Dr. Cook and Dr. Brown have to deal with the patients that we repair with esophageal atresia. Those patients we're realizing more and more are at risk of esophageal cancer lifelong. Um, and it's a huge source of morbidity. They need to be screened, and they need biopsies, um, and they need to be followed. Transplant is perhaps an obvious one as you transition from pediatric to adult care. There can be um, lapses in immunosuppressive medications. Young adults aren't always as good with their medications. Insurance is an issue. We'll, we'll touch on all those different things. Surgical oncology, the GIST patient who's 15 years old, how do we follow him? Who manages him as an adult? CF, cystic fibrosis, is a common one that we think about from the medical side, and that's probably one of the fields that um, has had a little more experience in transitioning. And finally, circling back to colorectal surgery, gynecology is a big issue. We, the pediatric surgeons, are the gynecologists for these patients. But clearly, we don't do adult gynecology. Adult gynecologists have little experience, if any, in pediatric gynecology. So why do we need to transition? Well, for the pediatric side, we have, quote, the expertise in pediatric problems, for example, Hirschsprung's disease and anorectal malformations. We tend to center on the child, and we have a lot of um, support and focus on the family and the parents. On the adult side, the expertise is in adult disorders, as you would imagine. For example, colorectal cancer. We as pediatric, sur pediatric surgeons don't have that much experience in colorectal cancer. Adults have expertise in disorders which peak in adulthood. So for example, infl inflammatory bowel disease has often two peaks in childhood and adulthood. So 
there's a little bit of expertise on both sides. But in adult care, very importantly, the patient's the primary decision maker, as opposed to in our field, where it tends to be the parent or the family. So there was a survey done in 2009, AAP is the American Academy of Pediatrics, looking at transitioning, and this is specifically in kids with some sort of special need. And these are their findings, and I think it's sobering, and it's nice to know where we're starting from. So only 16% of children reported that transition was ever even explicitly discussed. 60% of parents reported that they never received any sort of resources to help transition their child to an adult. What about providers? Well, 40% of pediatric providers reported a lack of adult specialists to care for older adolescents. It's not that the specialists aren't out there, they don't know who they are and who to partner with. 38% report a lack of insurance reimbursement for transition services, and that's reality, and that's the US in 2018. So if you're not getting reimbursed for these efforts, how do we make these efforts happen? And how do we make sure there's a commitment to making this happen? And how do we actually tie that to a financial incentive so that the hospital and the administration puts effort and money into this? More than 60% of pediatric providers said transitioning should begin at 18. Another quarter said transitioning should begin at age 15. So that's 85% of providers that think transitioning should happen after age 15. And I'll argue with you that that number, that age, should be significantly lower. So what is pediatric colorectal disease? And we're going to take a little bit of an aside because I think that um, it's helpful to know what do we do um, and what do we as pediatric surgeons do and what do we deal with. These are the kind of five common disorders that we deal with. We deal with Hirschsprung's disease, anorectal malformations that traditionally is called imperfect anus. A more umbrella term is anorectal malformations, and we're moving a little bit towards using that term. Cloaca is a special kind of disorder that I'll talk a little bit about as well. Inflammatory bowel disease, most of you have experience in IBD. And functional constipation is an issue both in childhood and adulthood, although on the adult side tends to be managed more by the GI docs. A little warning, there's some graphic pictures moving ahead. For um, the young people in the room, this is what our TVs used to look like in the 90s. <laughs> So Hirschsprung's disease, what is Hirschsprung's disease? Hirschsprung's disease is a disorder where the intestine, either the colon, small intestine, or sometimes the entirety of the, of the intestine, is missing these important nerve cells called ganglion cells. And those ganglion cells are supposed to migrate from the top of the GI tract all the way down to the bottom. And if they don't make it all the way down to the bottom, those, the, that part of the colon um, can't relax and you can't um, expel stool. And those patients can get very sick. If we're, if, if a patient without Hirschsprung's disease um, can't go to the bathroom, you just get constipated. Patient with Hirschsprung's disease can't go to the bathroom, they get a life-threatening disorder called enterocolitis, um, and they can die from enterocolitis. And that's still a significant source of morbidity throughout the world. Um, and at UC Davis, we probably admit a patient every one to two weeks with enterocolitis. And if they present late to us, they go to the ICU, they get very, very sick. In fact, I was on call last night, and we admitted a patient with presumed enterocolitis. This is what enterocolitis looks like in a Hirschsprung patient. What you're seeing is that massively dilated colon. This is the abdomen here. They get very, very sick. How do we diagnose it? Well, we start out with a contrast enema. What you see here is the rectum going into the sigmoid. And what we're looking for is what we call a reversal of the rectosigmoid ratio. So your rectum is supposed to be wider than your sigmoid. And if it's not, there's a reversal that's suggestive of Hirschsprung's disease. It's not diagnostic of Hirschsprung's disease, but it's suggestive of Hirschsprung's disease. And this is a patient here um, that we treated in the last two years. How do we treat it? Well, once we make the diagnosis, and the diagnosis is done by biopsy, looking for those ganglion cells, then we do what's called a pull-through procedure. And in that pull-through procedure, we remove the segment of colon 
that doesn't have the um, ganglion cells. Sometimes it can be a longer segment of colon. This is a transanal pull through, so we're going from below and we're taking out the segment of the colon that doesn't have ganglion cells. And we can actually go all the way up to the splenic flexure. So you can see this is a laparoscopic um, assisted pull through and we're removing that part that's abnormal. It can be the entirety of the colon. In that scenario, we often do an ileostomy until we confirm the diagnosis. It can sometimes be small and large colon. And then sometimes you can even have total intestinal ganglionosis. Um, which we've also seen in Sacramento in the last couple of years. Total intestinal ganglionosis is not compatible with long-term life without a transplant drug. What about anorectal malformations or imperforate anus? So decades ago, a few years ago, every baby had a thermometer up their rectum. No baby really left the nursery without um, this diagnosis being made. Every once in a while, we will see a baby who's a few days old and somebody missed and didn't notice that they don't have an anal opening. So this is a male, obviously, with an anorectal malformation. This is a female with an anorectal malformation. This is what's called a vestibular fistula. So in a female, obviously, you're not supposed to have the rectum in here. This is the uh, vestibule of the vagina, the detritus. The rectum should be here, and that's where, the, that's where the opening ended up. So this needs to be moved to the anal opening at the level of the sphincters. The reason this patient can pass stool, the problem is that she will never be continent unless that rectum is within the sphincter complex. So she'll pass stool, but she'll never be able to be continent. This is a male. The most common um, location where, where if there's going to be a fistula, so an anorectal malformation, where the rectum didn't make it down to the anus, but it somehow found its way to usually the GU tract in a male. So what you're seeing here, if you can make out, there's a little dark spot at the tip of the penis. And so that's the most common malformation we see in males, where there's a connection to the, to the urethra or the bladder. And this is an action shot <laughs> with the meconium at the tip of the penis and then there's meconium which is which is the first stool um, and the diaper so sometimes in fact very recently somebody told us that the, um, the baby passed stool it was in the diaper the baby showed up about three days after birth um, and they noticed that there was stool in the diaper thought everything was okay and it was until somebody did a good examination and they realized that there was no anal opening Thankfully, this can be fixed and this can be addressed. What we initially do often is an ostomy uh, where we divert the fecal stream till we can delineate the anatomy, usually a few months later, so that we can then plan our operation. The way we plan the operation is with this study. It's called a distal colostogram. So what you're looking at is a sagittal image of a baby under fluoroscopy. We've catheterized that mucus fistula that I showed you, which is here. And we've injected contrast into that distal segment of colon. What you're seeing here is a fistula to the urethra. Here's the urethra, and that's filling up the bladder. And this connection can happen to the bladder, often at the bladder neck, way up high. That has to be approached generally from the abdomen. It can happen anywhere along the urethra. This is the prostatic urethra. It can happen to the vulvar urethra. And then if it's quote unquote low, it could go all the way down to the perineum. So this is how we plan our operation to decide whether or not we can go from below and do what's called a posterior sagittal anorectoplasty, or we need to go from above and do some mobilization from above. And that becomes important because many of these operations, we can go from below, which means that the patient might not have any scars in their abdomen. They might not have a single scar in their abdomen, and their scar is actually in the buttock crease. And Babies, unlike adults, heal really well. One of the other reasons why pediatric surgery is a great field for all the young budding residents. Um, and so you might not realize that um, the baby even, the patient even had a surgery, and clearly the patient's not gonna remember this either. So what you're looking at, the ba this baby is in the prone position. The head is up here, the legs are down, and the back is up, and we're making a sagittal incision there, and we're looking for the rectum. So, a little audience participation, because I want to keep you guys engaged. So everyone raise your hand. Come on, 
Raise your hand. Perfect. Lower your hand if you think that we see the rectum in this picture. A couple of hands. Oh, more? More. Or people are getting tired. <laughs> All right. What about now? What about now? Most of the hands are going down. So actually, here in this picture, you can see here is the rectum. There's that whitish, fa whitish fascia of the rectum that we look for and try to find. And it's right there. And with that distal clostridium that I showed you, you should be able to predict exactly where that rectum is. You shouldn't injure the urethra. You shouldn't injure the bladder. Those things happen. People have pulled down the bladder, thinking that that was the rectum. None of that should happen. None of, that's think none of that, thankfully, has happened here at UC Davis, nor will it happen. But those are things that we see as a referral center at our colorectal clinic at Shriners. There's the rectum. We identify it. It's beautiful. We open it up. We find the fistula. You can see here that lacrimal duct probe is going into the fistula because we have to ligate that fistula. There's still that connection. If you pull down the rectum and you don't deal with the fistula, there's still a connection between the urethra and the rectum. We see here, we pull it through. We do these kind of tacking sutures on the serosa to try to prevent prolapse. We put it, we stimulate to know exactly where the anal sphincter is so that it goes directly in the center of the anal sphincter to increase this baby's chance for continence later in life. And this is what the anoplasty looks like. These sutures are on tension. Once we cut these sutures, which the residents know is my favorite part, the anus puckers in and goes away. What's a cloaca? <laughs> so a cloaca is what happens when all three channels, the urinary channel, the, the vaginal tract, and the rectum, end in one common tube. And that's a normal thing in certain species, birds for one, lizards for another. But it can also happen in humans. Um, and when that happens, you have to separate all three of those tracks. This is one depiction of what a cloaca can look like, and again, in the sagittal image. So here's the bladder. Here's the uterus and the vagina. Bladder here. Here's the rectum. And all three of these things end in one common channel. As you can see here, this is where the sphincters are. That rectum needs to end here. And these two orifices need to be separated and brought down so that there's not a communication between the vagina and the urinary tract. And this is a cloaca. It's a rare form of an anorectal malformation. What does it look like on exam? Well, if you don't do a proper exam, you might miss it. You might think it's just an anorectal malformation where there's just, there's just no anal opening and, not, and miss the fact that there's one common channel for all, for all three systems. If you do a proper exam, what you'll see is that there's just one hole where there should be three. Finally, fecal impaction is a disorder that we deal with a lot. Functional constipation is a disorder that we deal with a lot, even as surgeons. It's not fun. It's not glamorous. It's not sexy, but it's real, and it really makes a difference in patient's quality of life. So this is a patient from Shriners that we managed over the last couple of years. This is what her x-ray looked like. I think it gives all, me and my partners still a little bit of, um, uh, we get taken aback a little bit every time we see it, because um, the first time I think we had seen it, we all had that same reaction of what is going on here. Um, but this patient had severe, severe, severe functional constipation. We disimpacted her. We got her empty. She has a Malone appendicostomy now and is clean on flushes and is a completely different child. Um, so that was a little aside. Back to our regularly scheduled programming. Again, this is what TVs look like prior to streaming. So meet Greg. Greg is 53 years old. Um, Greg has imperforate anus or ha is a patient, a survivor of an anorectal malformation. Um, and he did not meet anybody that, um, else that had what he had until he was 53 years old. Never even knew that anyone else out there existed. He's from Australia. 
I met him in 2016 at a conference for patients and families with anorectal malformations. And it was the first time that he had actually physically met other people. He was so inspired, he wrote this book called A Secret Life. And he started an organization called One in 5,000 Foundation, which refers to the incidence, the reported incidence of anorectal malformations um, per live birth. And I'm just going to read a little quote from his book. He got to the age as a teenager where he knew he needed to find out about what had happened to him as a baby in regard to his surgeries. He could also vividly remember being in the hospital, but now he wanted some answers. But the most important question to him was, why were my parents and I told that I was fixed, but I still have tummy issues every single day? The doctor replied, well, you have been fixed as far as you couldn't do anything more surgically. So whatever you're dealing with now would be the way of life um, for the rest of your life. And the teenager, meaning Greg, was devastated. So what is the experience of adult patients with, with congenital colorectal diseases? So looking at anorectal malforma malformations in particular, 80% of, of adults with anorectal malformations report that no one ever discussed transitioning with them. 35% actually sought an adult healthcare provider and was turned away. A third, over a third. What are some active issues in, in older patients with anorectal malformations? Well, fecal incontinence, chronic constipation, urinary issues. So anorectal malformations have associated renal and urinary anomalies, about 50% of them. Sexual issues, ejaculatory, ejaculatory dysfunction, erectile dysfunction. A third of surgeons discharge patients from care before the age of 10. So not only do we not do a great job of following up what happens into adolescence and adulthood, we never even probably ask these questions ever and don't even know what the outcome is as pediatric surgeons and pediatric providers. One of the main issues is incontinence. So this was a study, this was a match um, case control study of over 100 patients out of Sweden with anorectal malformations compared to controls. And it's a busy table or busy graph. So what I'll just show you is that every single one of these is, is significant. On every single factor that they asked about, patients with anorectal malformations had worse outcomes in terms of continence, including soiling, need to rush to the toilet. What's important to know is that this isn't um, uh, irreversible. There are ways, there are things that can be done to help these patients so that they stay clean. What about we as providers? This was a survey of UK colorectal um, adult and pediatric um, providers. And they asked if they regularly employ multidisciplinary meetings. So 82% of them don't usually have meetings with an adult practitioner or transition coordinator. And 72% don't have a defined pathway or protocol to transition patients with anorectal malformations. The vast majority, this is us. This is UC Davis. We don't have this and we don't have that. Why? Why do providers say that they don't have these things? Well, the two most common things responses were a lack of structure in a current transition program and parental reluctance to transition. We blame the parents and we don't have a pathway. So there are barriers. We're going to talk about the barriers, but then we're going to talk about how, what we can actually do. So what are the challenges ahead? So from um, the adult side, what do our colleagues in the adult world say? Well, there's lack of training. Obviously, these aren't disorders that they, they train in, to learn about in fellowship or as adult um, general surgeons. It's difficult meeting the psychosocial needs. It's hard. We struggle with this as pediatric providers, and we have a lot more support. And on the adult side, you have the same issues, but don't have the same support system. There's a lack of time and reimbursement. So often the thought is that these patients don't need further intervention or further surgery. So there's no reimbursement related to this. And there's a lack of coordinated transfer from the pediatric providers, which is us. What do we report? Well, we say that there's a lack of adult physicians to care for young adults with chronic illness. Again, we report there's poor reimbursement for transitioning and our own reluctance to let go of that patient. We, we feel like we need to hang on to them. We know them best. We get just attached as attached to them as they get attached to us. 
What do the patients and the families report? Well, they say there's a difference in culture between the pediatric and adult healthcare models. It's true. Last week at m and we talked about how we chose one antibiotic because it tastes better than another antibiotic, which for us as pediatric surgeons just makes sense. And for everyone else in the room is like, what? There's nervousness about going to somebody that doesn't know me. They don't know that person and they don't know that provider. It's somebody new. So what about the different healthcare models? What about kind of on a more global um, scale? So on the adult side, what, what um, the emphasis is, is on the person, on the personal responsibility, on the patient. There's an expectation of independence, knowledge, and self-management. There are multiple providers, each caring for their separate issues. There's not as much coordinated, collaborative, multidisciplinary care or clinics. And there's less emphasis on social work or case management assistance. On the pediatric side, we, we put the responsibility on the provider and on the parent, not the child, obviously. There's comprehensive multidisciplinary clinics. There's a spina bifida clinic. There's a CF clinic. We have a colorectal clinic. There's case management and social support. If a patient can't make it to clinics repeatedly, our case managers and our social workers will send somebody to that house and make sure that kid's OK and make sure there's not some other issue going on. <coughs> there's a social responsibility to the patient. We feel like this is a kid, no child left behind, right? So we have to do something. The moment they become an adult, that goes out the window. Pediatric surgeons in particular, we're the primary care providers. I mention this to our resident team all the time, is that we are a primary care service. And un unlike most surgical services, we admit that child abuse patient or that rule out child abuse patient. We admit that gallstone pancreatitis patient who is on GI will transfer them to our service because we know overall that overall care, we know how to take care of that as primary care surgeons, really. And we're used to that role. We like that role. Most of us went into pediatric surgery because that attracted us to the field. This is the, the big issue, reimbursement, which I don't have a solution for, but at least we can talk about it and mention it. Uninsured rates are much higher for young adults than compared to the national average. That's just a fact. Young adults just don't have as much insurance. Um, insurance coverage often, often changes as they transition, as they get off their parents' insurance and go to their adult uh, provider. Young adults are more mobile. So Dr. Farmer had a patient recently who she, uh, she knew from, she was a baby from San Francisco, and what she was seeing here that was going off to college at Columbia in New York and figuring out how to transition her care to a provider out in New York that can manage her and see her. Not only just transition to an adult provider, because she could have called any of you in the room, and I'm sure you would have answered that phone call, but the patient was moving across the country. And there's a perception that no further interventions or procedures are needed. That's, that's just wrong. Probably at least a third of those patients could benefit from some sort of intervention or procedure. And that means that there is reimbursement tied to this. And even though it's not about money, it's about taking care of the patient, if that's really what's going to be an issue, what we need to look at is how, did, how can we generate some sort of revenue to make it worth um, the provider's time. So insurance status by age. Um, you can see here there's a nice drop off for young adults. And it doesn't really um, keep going back to pre-adult um, levels until about the 60s. This, that was before the ACA, the uh, Affordable Care Act, even after the Affordable Care Act. Young adult and uninsured rates were high and are still higher, although it's gotten better. But this is only until 2014. <laughs> so those are the barriers, but there is help. There are ways that we can actually make this transition. There are many different ways to skin a cat. <laughs> so there's a few other few resources out there. Got Transition is a program based out of Washington, DC. It's a nonprofit that works towards transitioning. And they have guidelines, not just for surgical care, but all sorts of uh, both medical and surgical issues. These are their six core elements of healthcare transitioning. You need a policy. You got to start with the policy, whatever that policy is. You need to track and monitor that transition as the patient um, gets older and then goes into adulthood. You have to monitor the readiness. You have to make sure they're ready for transitioning. 
you have to actually plan how are you going to transition, what are you going to do, which provider is that patient going to go to, what are they going to ask, what are they going to say. Then you actually have to do the transfer of care, actually do what you plan to do, and then the completion is when the transfer is complete. Seems easy. Here's a recommended timeline. The key point I'll point out is that most recommendations now say you should start around age 12. That means we as pediatric surgeons have to start that discussion when we see them in the office and ask them about and assess their transition readiness. And that's different for every patient. So some patients might be developmentally delayed. They may never really be able to participate in their care, but many of the patients have, are completely 100% functionally normal and can for sure start that process. And then really by about 18, 18 to 22, you should be transitioned out of uh, pediatric care. Here's one model called the shared management model where you move from the provider to the youth taking the responsibility. So younger ages, the provider has a responsibility. By the time um, that patient is older, they're this primary supervisor. And you're just there as a resource, and the parents are just there as a consultant. So I used this recently in a patient of ours who's about 16 years old as an anorectal malformation. He was having trouble with flushes at school in the spring, but it was only at school. It was never when he was home, so there was some anxiety involved, and his mother emailed me, and we're working out what to do. And then I saw him in the office about a month ago and had a conversation with first him and then him and his parents about next time he has issues, I want him to email me directly. I don't want him to go through his parents. He said that he does his flush nine times out of 10, but every once in a while he's a teenager and he doesn't want to do it and he has his mom make a saline and put his, the glycerin in. So I told him that one time he needs to cut out and I told his parents they need to say no. He needs to work, start working on transitioning to him actually doing his own flushes 100% of the time. I'm going to talk about three different models. This is Necker Children's in Paris, the premier children's hospital, not just in France, but one of the premier hospitals in Europe. This is OSU, Buckeyes. I lived in uh, Columbus for two years. I became an honorary Buckeye. Um, and Sick Kids in Toronto, which is one of the um, major children's hospitals um, in, the, in the world. So what does Toronto Sick Kids do? They have this program called Good to Go. There's a discussion in every clinic starting with age 12. They trans have a transitioning of the clinic prior to age 18. There's ongoing communication between providers. And they actually have this, they encourage this My Health three sentence summary for the patient to talk about when he goes to his office visits, where he says, This is my age, my diagnosis, my brief medical history, my treatment plan, and these are my questions for the visit. Right? The perfect presentation, right? <laughs> the medical student, the resident, um, telling you exactly what needs to happen. <clears throat> They have this wonderful website uh, where you can actually create a passport. So you put in your diagnosis. So let's say your issue is you have a psychostomy, or it could be a congenital heart disease. It could be um, any of a number of different disorders. And then you actually, so for psychostomy, you say, what kind of psychostomy tube do I have? What length is it? What do I use it for? What do I put in there? Do I put glycerin? Do I put Castile soap? Do I just use saline? Do I use water? And you make an actual passport, and then you print that out, and you have that with you. And it's true not just for, like I said, psychostomies, but for any sort of pediatric issue as they're transitioning. Necker Children's in Paris has a model where they, their transition process is relatively short. So I'm going to show you three different models. They kind of start at least six months um, before, although I'll argue that we really need to be starting closer to age 12. What's really interesting about their model and why I want to mention their model is that the pediatric provider actually accompanies the patient to their first adult visit. So it's not just the patient that shows up um, to Dr. Halabi's office. It's, I, I'll be there with them. Hey, this is my patient. This is what's going on. It's a very interesting model. Ohio State has a very interesting model as well. So they have trained a surgeon with specific pediatric colorectal training who has then done an adult colorectal fellowship. She just completed last year. So she has specific training in both adult and pediatric colorectal disorders, the only one in the country or the world that we know of. Her name is Ali Geisher. And she will see the patient at Nationwide Children's, which is the children's hospital about three miles away. And then she will be the same provider to see that patient at the OSU main medical center. We're in a very unique scenario here at UC Davis because we have both those things at the same place. 
unlike Toronto, unlike Paris, and even unlike OSU, because these campuses are actually miles away, we have everybody in the same medical center. So we should be able to do this much better than they can do this. So some recommendations here at UC Davis is that we start at about age 12. We initiate some annual self-assessment surveys around age 14. We talk about their general health knowledge assessment. That patient needs to know what happened to them. Just like Greg Ryan had no idea what ever happened to him. And that patient, that 45-year-old patient that comes up to your office and says, you know, do I need a colonoscopy? They don't know where their transition was. Did they take the entirety of the colon out? Did they take part of the colon out? They might not know. We have to educate these patients so they know. Um, and then have integrated clinical meetings with both pediatric and adult colorectal surgeons, care teams, at least have a discussion about who's transitioning, where are we at with these patients, and then hopefully complete trans the transition by age 21. So some take home points. I hope that I got across to you. We should start the transition process early. We should identify adult providers, surgeons, gastroenterologists, you know, it doesn't matter necessarily what specialty they're in. They need to have interest um, and, and experience um, to move forward and to partner. For our adult partners, we need you guys to partner with us and work with us into, um, into helping transitioning these patients. So just not necessarily when one patient happens to come to your office, but can we figure out a way that we have this wonderful um, group of patients that we know is getting older how do we transition them to, to UC Davis? Because we don't want them to go to Stanford or UCSF or elsewhere. We need to educate the patients and the caregivers about the disease, so the patients themselves. And we need to encourage our hospital to develop a transition policy and process and to compensate appropriately. I'll let Dr. Farmer figure that part out. <laughs> If you guys can't read in the back, I don't know. And now at this point in the meeting, I'd like to shift the blame from me to someone else. So my fellow pediatric surgeons, what do we need to do? We need to prepare the child to advocate for themselves, start that discussion, prepare the family for transitioning. We need to develop those policies and processes for transitioning. We're starting to do that kind of on an ad hoc basis, but I think it'd be helpful to have an actual policy. And we can start with colorectal, but it's not just colorectal. There was a patient with clipal Trinawi syndrome, which that patient gets had a uh, venal lymphatic malformation of their leg, who's in their 20s. That was recently on the, on the surgical adult surgical service. So those patients we know about, we're treating right now. It shouldn't be a surprise to you when they show up to the ER with a bunch of drainage and, and abscesses or other issues. We need to identify appropriate adult providers for our patients, and we need to provide support through and after. We need to be there for questions. If an adult provider calls us and has an issue as a question, hey, I just got this patient who moved here from Texas. They, had, they have a cloaca. What do I need to do? Well, we need to be there to answer the phone and say, this is what you need to work up. This is, you need to make sure that the patient still has the malarian structures. Does that patient want to have a baby? Does she want to carry a baby? Can she carry a baby? Those kinds of issues. What are the perceived barriers to transition of care of young adults? This is from the pediatric surgeons. The number one thing that we did was blame that there was no qualified adult surgeons, and I think that's a fallacy, and I think that's not true. In fact, there are way more adult providers than there are pediatric surgeons, so how can that be possible? Um, the, the thing that we reported least was insurance. I bet this should probably be higher, and that should probably be lower. So what do we do? What about our adult surgeon colleagues? <clears throat> we need to recognize that pediatric colorectal disease leads to lifelong problems. It's never too, too late to improve quality of life. That patient who's 30 that's having soiling, that patient might benefit from a colon resection. That patient may benefit from an appendicostomy, from a cecostomy, a bowel management program, maybe laxatives, maybe all of the above. Who knows? But that patient should have a better quality of life. No one should soil all day. Everyone should be able to be clean for at least 24 hours. And that's our goal, and that's our mission in the kids, and should be the same goal and mission for an adult. We'd like you to partner with us as pediatric providers, open the dialogue, and maintain it. Transition is in your future. 
for everyone in the room. So we'll go back to our cases. That 45-year-old male with Hirschsprung's disease, he had a pull-through when he was age two. He presents your office asking about his chances for colorectal cancer. He wants to know if he needs a colonoscopy. Anyone wants to answer? You're welcome to venture a guess. So what we know now, does anyone want to go? No. What we know now in 2018 is probably should follow the same guidelines as everybody else. So the USPS task force says age 50. The American Cancer Association recently threw it down to 45. So probably, depending on which guideline you're going to follow, that should probably be the same thing for the first rung patient. Although, you have to believe that with repeat episodes of enterocolitis and inflammation, could that patient be at a higher risk of cancer? And we don't know that answer because these patients weren't living because of age. The original operations for, for Hirschman's disease weren't until you know, the mid 20th century. So these patients are just starting to be out there. So we need to figure out and study if these patients have a higher colorectal cancer risk. Maybe we should be screening them at age 30, maybe 25, maybe 35. We can develop that policy because no one has that policy out there. That 29-year-old patient with a cloaca who comes in as a trauma, you think you're going to be in the right upper quadrant mostly? Well, maybe you should do a paramedian incision. Maybe you should avoid the appendicostomy altogether and then Malone and then the Trophanoff altogether. And maybe that's the way that you would do your laparotomy. Maybe you want to do a subcostal incision if you truly aren't going to be looking down the pelvis. The patient that had the repaired and perforated anus who has a stricture on exam, well, how do you determine his ability for fecal continence and whether stricture biopsy may be helpful? Well, you need to figure out what his level of the malformation was. Did he have a perineal fistula, meaning the rectum went all the way down? Those patients have an excellent chance for continence. Does he have a bladder neck fistula with a sacral agenesis, myelomeningocele? Well, those patients probably have a really poor chance for continence, and that patient probably is better served with an appendicostomy or a cecostomy. So those are the questions you have to ask. We know those answers as pediatric providers. So we, we have that uh, information to give you. And then you decide whether or not a structuroplasty may help or may not help. And how do you do it? So this is a patient who comes in with cerebral palsy, developmental delay, has a large bowel obstruction. What's the operation you perform? Well, I think absolutely the right thing, which was relieve the obstruction, rule the patient out for Hirschsprung's disease and then do an elective resection down the line. Because this patient probably does not have Hirschsprung's disease. We deal with this patient all the time. The developmentally delayed patient, not, their intestine just over time works less and less. And this is not the typical presentation for Hirschsprung's disease. And then this 47-year-old patient who's had a few years of distension, and we do a rectal biopsy, and there's hypoganglionosis. So what's your next step? Probably motility probably GI referral, motility studies, to get a sense of that patient's motility. This patient, by definition, does not have ganglion, does not have Hirschsprung's disease, if you trust your pathologist. And sometimes we do have, get a second um, opinion on our pathology. But if that patient has even one ganglion cell, in theory, it should not be Hirschsprung's disease, although we're learning more and more about that. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Division of Pediatric Surgery, Dr. Hiroshi, our chief, and my partners, for their support in our colorectal program in particular. Um, Dr. Farmer in the Department of Surgery, everyone here in this room, um, for allowing me to speak and um, support in our pediatric um, services. And uh, Dr. Trepe Galgansi Kapagambe, who are research residents who've been actively involved in the colorectal um, program and have done research on the colorectal program. Two of my mentors, Dr. Langer and Dr. Levitt, um, who helped um, train me. And I'll open it up to any questions. <laughs> always a challenge to make, you know, the poop lecture interesting. <laughs> so, um, and wow, I think you, you really highlighted a problem that we all just try to push under the rug and pretend doesn't happen. And it's interesting when you get to be an old pediatric surgeon, those patients start calling you from all over the country because they don't know where to go uh, when they're 25 and they're in college or someplace else. And so we, we don't do a good job. And it's a great opportunity for a place like UC. So I think we threw the gauntlet. Question? Um, not a question, more of a statement. I mean, wonderful talk, and of course, very 
I, I remember being at University of Pittsburgh and I saw an 84 year old gentleman with a cutting crew. And of course I'm thinking he must have been like the first baby ever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Farkas, for that comment. I think you're absolutely right. It takes a ton of resources, and those visits can be very long. We, our colorectal clinic used to be part of our pediatric surgery clinic at Shriners, and we pulled that away because we were spending so much time with these patients, um, usually you know, even an hour or more. I think one thing that helps us is that we try to get all the records in advance of that visit and review them as a team. So not just one person reviewing them, but we all try to review them as a team so that whoever walks into that um, patient's room already has a, a, an idea and a plan as to what needs to happen in terms of does there need to be a workup, does there need to be a contrast study, or do we need a rebiopsy, or no, do we not need to? And that reduces our time a bit, not not a lot, but a bit, but having those records. From the adult side, those records should all be there. So we just have to be able to give those records to you and maybe help hone down on the main issues and also educate the patient so that that visit is more focused. And I think that's what we can try to do to make that easier. And if there was one great idea, we'd have a physician extender who bridges both programs. Uh, so if we don't have a surgeon that can necessarily go to the you know pediatric meetings or a pediatric surgeon that can go to the adult um, clinic visit, maybe there's a, a extender provider that is the transition, so not a transition surgeon, but a transition nurse practitioner or, or a nurse. Dr. Hiroshi. That's a great talk. I, I think that one of the things that, that, um, that adult providers worry is that you know, all the surgery has been done, and that these patients don't need anything more. I'd like to comment on, on some of that, because it turns out that that may not be the truth. Really. That these patients don't just need a GI doctor, they actually still need a surgery. Yeah, absolutely true. They, I saw a girl just to follow up on that who made the decision. She, you know, she had been dealing with her bowel management and made the decision as about a 30-year-old that she would rather have a colonoscopy. That, that from, from the quality of life point of view. Now, it may or may not have been, but depending on what their circumstances are, that may have been the right decision for her. But helping them make those decisions, and it takes a while to get the maturity to know what the word quality of life even means. Thank you for your question. That's a that's a very important question, and definitely 
I could spend a lot of time talking about. I think that um, it could be the next round. Could be the next round. It's okay. I didn't want to talk about just poop the whole time for an hour, so I figured we could talk about something else, and then I'll transition to pooping only. Um, I, th I think what we do, we try to do, is we assess that patient's um, uh, ability for what their quality of life can look like. Some of those patients um, will never be continent, uh, will never be able to achieve continence for stool for various reasons, um, you know, whether they have a spinal anomaly or some other issue. We ask whether or not they're continent for urine, or not is the goal for that patient and that family to be out of diapers and sometimes that is their goal because they're just soiling all the time in the diaper well then we start being more aggressive in terms of working that patient up perhaps doing motility studies perhaps consider doing an anterograde enema option like a cecostomy or, or a malone and you're absolutely right in the developmentally delayed kids we tend to do cecostomies more than we do a malone because they don't like the intubation of the tube if that patient is not incontinent of urine doesn't have any ability, well, and the family doesn't mind changing the diapers, and the patient's not soiling all the time, well, then we're less aggressive, because what, what's your goal, you know? Is that patient trying to go to school, and it's soiling, or is that patient homebound? So it's kind of what we have to assess what their ability um, um, in the ideal circumstance would be, and decide how, how can we get there. And if we decide that this is not you know, the best that they can get, but for their quality of life, the scenario that they're in, if this is what they want or their family feels is best for them, then we tend to take a hands-off approach. Um, and that's why they end up to you guys at age 22, because we've kind of set, sat back for a little bit. Dr. Rapp, last question. So um, as you mentioned, it's a problem with uh, general patients as well. And I think you outlined a really nice plan and a similar plan on the congenital side for patients. But my question is, so when uh, Society of Thoracic Surgeons looked at adult patients who had follow-up surgery who weren't congenital trained versus those who were congenital trained, there was a big difference in morbidity and mortality. And those patients now were going back to congenital surgeons even in the adult role, because we're all adult trained. Yeah. Is there any data like that on the pediatric side? That's a great point. And I think probably, um, you know, Congenital heart disease is probably the, the premier example of that. Colorectal, I think, um, we'll see how Dr. Geisher bridges that pediatric colorectal side, being trained kind of in both sides. The, the, the difference, I think, for us is that um, generally the surgeries are pretty much the same. There's some unique, you know, PSARP is not something that an adult general surgeon will do, but a colon resection is. Uh, Hirschsprung's pull-through, well, that's just a, t tends to be just a, um, uh, low anterior resection for the most part, and you can do that in you know, a mucosectomy, you can do that um, pull through. Um, so I think for us, our specific field, I think that we have expertise on both sides and the operations for the most part. So I think it's going to end up being subspecialty dependent. And I think it's, I think you're right, an adult cardiac surgeon shouldn't be operating or reoperating on a congenital heart disease patient unless they have specific training. I think um, that's probably less true for colorectal disease, and each sub subspecialty has to decide, you know, what they feel is, is, is the right um, expertise for them and training for them. All right. We could go on for a long time, uh, and I yep. think there'll be, this could apply to many fields, but time, thank you very much.